Hey everyone, Viv here. In case you missed it, I wanted to let you know that we have a fortnightly email newsletter. We give you the latest recap on all things happening in our community. In there, you'll also be the first to know about our next events, merch drops, and exciting announcements. Head on over to levelasianpodcast.com forward slash newsletter to sign up for the latest. Now, on to the episode. Fuck the police coming straight from the the reason why everyone was incarcerated, not only was it due to disadvantage or some sort of childhood trauma, it was a lack of education. Mm -hmm. I wanted to change. I wanted to do something different. I didn't have a father figure, so I always looked up to all the older boys. And all the older boys used to always hang out this place called Bimmy Street Billiards. There's all smoke at the back. And one day there was a huge gang fight and someone got murdered. Right. And I was a witness to the murder. Yard is where all the trouble is. Everyone's yeah. just training, they're taking drugs. There was like four or five fights going on every day. There's two phones in the yard, right? The Aboriginals own one phone, the Muslims own the other phone. If you're not an Aboriginal or Muslim, you can't use that phone. So one time I just snuck on and I was like, I'll call my lawyer ASAP. Next thing I know, my shirt gets put over my head. Someone starts laying into me. I turn around and this guy is like literally just half my size. I'm like, this guy. Kicked him. Black belt taekwondo, I kicked him in the head. <laughs> Knocked out, yes. right? The whole yard just went quiet. Everyone just stood up. I was like, oh, f Before we get started on today's episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the land of the Darug people. We would like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and the next generation coming through. Now, on to today's episode. Joe, appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Dude, this is, a, this is a long time coming because I remember when we first launched Level Asian and we were coming up with a list of dream guests and uh, one of our guys was like, you got to check out this guy, Joe Kwan from like Convict <laughs> Fitness. So this was like at the start of last year. Yeah. And, um, and as I delved deeper into it and got to really understand, like a good understanding of what you're doing, um, it was nothing but respect because I think whilst I probably didn't find myself on the other side of the tracks, um, I think many people can relate. I grew up in the Southwest. We were talking about this off camera as well. Um, and like you said, we all know that sort of friend or someone who we knew growing up that um, experienced what you experienced growing There's up. There's always well. someone. Always someone, There's right? Always someone. So I guess the best place to start is actually just, you know, I know you've told this story many, many times before, but, you know, maybe our listeners don't know who you are. Um, can you sort of tell us a little bit about what your background is, the story that led you to where you are now? I know it's going to be a long story, but we, we've got time. Um, yeah, maybe start with childhood and growing up and what that's like. Yeah, <clears throat> just an introduction. My name is Joe Kwan. Um, so I'm currently CEO and founder of a social enterprise called Convict Fitness, where we help uh, incarcerated inmates or incarcerated individuals when they come into the community to find community support and uh, career in fitness. So they could give back to society through fitness. Mm -hmm. um, and also I run a charity course, uh, Confit Pathways, where we provide uh, lived experience mentoring. So all those guys who are coming out of the prison system are now becoming mentors right. to go back into the youth justice space to mentor young people around positive mindset, fitness, and providing a pathway to employment and education mm -hmm. once they get out into the community. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. Um, it's funny because I started this because I ended up doing uh, nine years in prison. Mm -hmm. I got sentenced to 13 years. Um, I, I spent nine years and I got uh, released on uh, good behavior. Mm -hmm. And when I came out, I didn't even know what a social enterprise or a not-for-profit was, you know? <laughs> yep. I got arrested for directing a criminal enterprise. <laughs> now, Different type funny, of business. Funny thing, I'm, <laughs> I'm directing a social enterprise, yeah, you right. know? Uh, funny how things change, but you know, my mom first came to Australia um, in the 80s. Uh, she came here as an international student on a scholarship. She was a opera singer. Yeah, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she was at one of the best universities um, in South Korea and she got offered a scholarship at the uh, Sydney Conservatorium of Music. Okay. And she came here, zero English, you know, but she had a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. um, so she had like the best coaches to coach her in singing. And it was a bit of a conflicting childhood because you know, on the outskirts, my mum, you know, she comes from an educated background. My grandma was a university lecturer as well in South Korea. Um, and she's living this, she appears to be living this lavish lifestyle because she's going to these nice concerts. And when she does the concert, she's dressed up mm. in these dresses. There's people praising her about all these things. But then when I go home, 
we had nothing, you right. know? So it was like catch 22, you know, you're living like that. Mm. But then at that time we couldn't even get public housing because um, I, even though I was born here. Mm -hmm. So my mum was, my mum met another opera singer mm -hmm. uh, here. They got married and they had me in Australia. So I was born in 1987, Ron Randwick Hospital, <laughs> you know? Um, and at that time they didn't allow us to get citizenship because they don't, they don't uh, at that time the law was, if you're an international student and you have children here, your children cannot get citizenship. Really? Oh, okay, so this I, is- I only became a citizen when I was in year nine. Really? Yeah. So oh. until then, we were just going place to place. Mum was scraping by, you know, dad left um, early, right. at an early age. So it was just my mum um, raising me up, single child, single mother. And we just grew up in kind of like rough areas because that was the only areas that my mum could afford mm -hmm. to live in. So, you know, those old red brick flats, you know, the two story flats, Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, um, but it was, look, it, it, we were surrounded by a lot of diverse cultures. You know, I had a huge family of Filipinos living next door. I had a huge family of Samoans living the other side. And I had a Lebanese family living at the back. And all the kids, we just congregate. And, you know, and at that time, you know, kids get up to no good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get up trouble, to no yeah. good. Um, and I was living at Campsy at that time. Um, so it was like primary school living in Campsy and then, you know, I didn't have a father figure. So I always looked up to all the older boys and all the older boys used to always hang out this place called, um, it's called the um, Beamy Street Billiards. It's gone now, okay. but they have- at, Like at the room yeah, 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 at yeah. the front, they've got all the Street Fighter arcade games yeah, and everything. Yeah. Uh, and at the back, they've got all the pool rooms and that's where all the gangsters used to hang out. They still smoke at the back and, you know, me being a cheeky kid as I was, you know, I used to always play arcade games and I used to run out of money <clears throat> and go to these guys and go, hey, can you give me a couple of dollars? Yeah. You know, and then um, that's how I got to know them, right? And then um, you know, I still always ask them for cigarettes as well. And they used to give me a couple of cigarettes. I'll take <laughs> it to school. I'll be this bad kid at school. Um, yeah, and then just one day I s ended up um, staying there just one afternoon and there was a huge gang fight and someone got murdered. Right. And I was a witness to the murder. I was in year five at that time. And the police called my mum up and she goes, uh, the, the police are like, your son, we need you to come down as a, as a guardian because your son needs to- um, Give a statement. Give a statement, yep. you know? And I was taught from a young age to not fucking talk about right. anything, you yeah, know? Right. And I, I didn't say a word yep. and they took it as this kid is traumatized, you know? Oh, so what, they were trying to help you or? <laughs> they brought me to see all these psychs and everything. And yeah. I'm just like, why am I here? But you were okay. <laughs> I was I was okay, yeah. I was okay, you yeah. know? It wasn't the guys that I used to look up to, it was someone else. Right. You know, um, and that's the kind of childhood environment that I grew up in, mm. you know? Um, and, and for me, it was also because I never had anything. Like mom still put food on the table, but I never got to have any of the other stuff, you know, like mm. um, on the weekends, you know, the kids would be talking about, you know, they're going fishing with their dad or they're going camping. I'm like, what the fuck is camping? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I always always wanted that stuff, mm. you know, um, but I, we, I, I never had money as well because like kids always have like Nintendo games and all these toys. Yep. All I had was a stolen bike. Right. You know, and mum would be like, she put a blind up to her, which, <laughs> you know, but obviously she didn't want to say anything either, mm. you know. Um, for me, that was special. I used to go around everywhere on my bike. And, you know, I had a, I feel like I had a very entrepreneurial mind. Um, it's a hustler. It's like, I guess the environment kind of makes you as well. Yep. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, so downstairs, we were living, so this two block flat, we were living upstairs. Downstairs, there was a Chinese family and an Aussie couple. Mm -hmm. They were older, like kind of like Bogans, right? Mm -hmm. And they always be drunk. Mm -hmm. And they threw out this box, right? Um, and you know, like when you're a kid, you go through all the rubbish and stuff, right? And I was a lonely kid, only child, right? So I was going through this box and it was full of porno mags. Oh, really? <laughs> and I was like, bingo. Right? Jackpot. <laughs> Jackpot. <laughs> so I've now taken it to the school in my primary school <laughs> and I've gone one page, $1, double spread page, $2. So you were selling it. I was selling porno pages right. to kids, right? Yep. Anyway, I was the richest kid <laughs> in primary school and I became the fattest kid because I was eating pizza pockets, like 10 <laughs> pizza pockets a day from the canteen and stuff, right? Obviously, one of these kids got caught by their parents and this kid stitched me up. Um, and then the, pr the, 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 yeah, the principal called my mom in, right? Mm. And then 
the principal, Mr. Scully, that's who his name was. <laughs> and he goes, Mr. Literally, Mr. Scully. Mr. Like, Scully, that's like his name. The, like the Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, that's, his, that's his, Mr. Scully, yeah. yeah, yeah he was yeah. a ginger beard man. And, yeah. and he goes, oh, Mrs. Kwan, I don't know how to put this to you, but your son's been selling pornographic material to other students. And she didn't understand until he pulled out all the, the material, she just looked at me, she just went, <laughs> Back when it was okay. <laughs> and I like, guess that was like kind of the start of like my entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, you know? right. Selling little porno mags to other kids. So you kids. just inclined to do that basically. That was the no, thing that came to your head? No, because I just wanted, I just wanted the stuff, the little things that the other kids had. Yeah, you, you had know? deficiencies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to buy sweets as well, you know, I wanted to buy toys. Mm -hmm. I didn't get that, you know, and yep. that was my way of trying to trying to get those things, mm. you know. Yeah. And so it sounds like you were doing this, you would, you know, you're a carefree kid. Um, you were looking at obviously just opportunities. You're trying to fill your own cup, basically. When did sort of um, whether it was like gangs or crime, when did that sort of start to come in? Because, you know, you got up to what, <clears> like primary school? Yeah, yeah. So funny thing. So, you know, after that, uh, I witnessed that murder. Mum's mm -hmm. uh, like, we're getting out of the area. So she thought, okay, the best area that she could think of was North Shore. Right. She's like, how do we get into North Shore, right? <laughs> so she, the only place she could afford was Hornsby at the time. And right. back then Hornsby was like, there was nothing yeah, there, yeah, right? Yeah. It was uh, the fringes. Yeah, and the Westfield wasn't even there, mm -hmm. right? So it was like <clears throat> just an old kind of like town, a very quiet like population of like just pretty much old people, mm -hmm. right? And then she somehow got me into St. Pius, which was like a Catholic private, kind of semi-private, mm -hmm. she saved up so much money just to send me there. She goes, I want my kid to have a good life, mm -hmm. you know? And then got there year seven, <laughs> ended up getting expelled straight away. <laughs> For what? Yeah, because um, I was a junior black belt at that time. Right. You know, you know, us Koreans, we learn how to kick before course, we can yeah. walk, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I was a junior black belt at that time and I was one angry kid because there was like, kind of like a hole in my heart, you know, abandoned by a father, mm -hmm. you know, I was always looking, attention seeking, all the time, right? Mm. And yeah, so I, I just had a thing for kicking people. <laughs> I guess, so you got you know? into fights. Yeah, I got into fights a lot, yeah. you know? And that kind of caught the attention of the local gang. And I joined the gang in year seven. And at that time, I was really young, you know? It wasn't the criminal factor that got me, it was the acceptance and the social belonging mm -hmm. side that actually attracted me towards joining a gang because these guys were kind of like misfits and it feels like, you know, people from broken head families kind of gravitate towards each other, yeah. you know, the kids. Um, and for me, it was just a place of comfort. You know, when I go to school straight away, they're like, Joe, get out of class. Mm. You know, uh, I didn't feel wanted or accepted at school. Mm -hmm. I felt accepted uh, in, in my street gang, mm. you know, so we used to jig school you know, skip school all the time. And, you know, back in those days, just spend the whole day at karaoke, yeah, and get, getting into fights <laughs> with other groups. And, yeah. you know, that, that, that's, <clears throat> I started from there and then the criminality factor slowly starts to creep in, you know, like you get introduced to, you know, dropping off drugs, making a little bit of coin. I was like, mm. oh, yeah, I'm making a little bit of money, mm. you know, and then that started evolving to other things. And, you know, and one thing led to another. Um, one day I was doing a, <clears throat> interstate drop mm -hmm. for the group. Uh, it was in WA and uh, we're dropping off uh, I think half a key, half a key of MDMA. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting kidnapped because uh, these guys were owed money from my gang. Right. And I was there for two days, right? And oh, they kept me for ransom and they didn't pay up. And look, they roughed me up and everything. But the funny thing was they let me go mm. and they go, it just shows what kind of brotherhood you have they mm. don't even, they're not even answering our phone wow, calls now. Wow, okay. <clears throat> and what was your reaction? My reaction was, fuck this, I'm taking all the risk, you yep. know? And as, that was at the age when I could start thinking for myself a little bit. How old were you? Uh, just turned 17. Right, Yeah, okay. so uh, now I'm thinking, you know what? Uh, this is too much, right? Mm. Uh, I'm taking all the risk. Um, I'm gonna start off doing my own stuff. Mm -hmm. So I ventured off doing my own stuff. Mm. You know, that caused a lot of problems as well, but started from there and then, you know, by the time I was 21, I was running a you know, directing a criminal syndicate. Mm -hmm. And then it was on my actual uh, month after my 21st birthday, you know, <clears throat> I was staying at the Shangri-La Hotel. Mm -hmm. And that morning I did a massive drug deal, had cash literally all on the coffee table. And then um, little did I know, I had 
police surveillance him, surveillance him for months. Right. And they they had the whole place bugged out, cameras, uh, and they so had- So waiting. Yeah, and they yeah. had the- um, tactical response group mm -hmm. in the door in the next room mm -hmm. uh, because they knew we all have firearms mm. and then um i did the deal and then i ordered breakfast that morning straight away to celebrate i was hungry right yeah, i was yeah, like yeah. i still remember i ordered a big big breakfast orange juice and a, and a long black yeah. and then um I thought it was room service because I got a knock on the door. So I had the coffee table covered with a sheet, like a like a bed sheet, mm -hmm. right? And then um, I got a knock on the door. So I'm walking towards the door. The door just swings open and you see all these guys wearing black, you know, coming with these massive machine yeah, guns right. saying, get the fuck on the floor. And, yeah. you know, the first thing goes through my mind was, this is not my breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I ordered a long black, yeah, with not my orange scary juice. guys wearing black <laughs> with machine guns in my face. Yeah. Uh, but the second thought was, crap, I'm getting robbed because they're all wearing balaclavas. So you thought it was another gang? I thought I was getting robbed. So you never yeah. thought in your mind it was <sighs> the cops? Well, when you're in that game, right? You always get robbed. There's always, you gotta be on your toes because someone right. will do a deal and they get people to rob you. So I thought mm -hmm. I was getting I was getting done over. And it happened so much. Like obviously that's the first thing that goes through my mind. Little mm -hmm. did I know I was being under, I was under surveillance for so long, yeah. right? And then I've thrown the cash everywhere. I'm thinking, yep, they're just after the cash, not mm. me, because I know how shit goes down. Like mm. if you like, you know, retaliate, they'll probably shoot you, right? right. Yep. So I'm thinking you have to the cash, throwing the cash on the floor, beeline for the door. I get a machine gun to the side of the head. And then literally like I'm fucking concussed, mm -hmm. right? And then I'm getting hogtied and I hear the words, you're under arrest, this is the police. Yeah, wow. And literally everything was in slow motion. Literally I had like a hundred dollar bill stuck to my face because there's cash <laughs> everywhere. And then, you know, I was staying at the Shangri-La Hotel at the executive suite and I'm looking out the floor to ceiling window mm -hmm. and I see the opera house and the Harbour Bridge. Now, <laughs> it was such a running moment because my mom used to take me to the opera house all the time as a kid. Mm -hmm. And now I'm getting arrested seeing the opera house. And Massive it, irony, it, isn't it? It looks so beautiful, you yeah. know, and, it, you know, I'd never seen the beauty of the opera house like that. And in that, in that moment, it made me realize how I took everything for granted, mm. you know, and that was the last view of freedom that I saw and I ended up getting locked up, sentenced to 13 years in prison for directing a criminal enterprise at the age of 21. Wow. And so you said you were locked away for nine years. Yep. So really what people classify as like, you know, the, the most thriving part of their life during their twenties and, you know. Yeah. Pretty much I lost my whole twenties. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you were so I just, I just turned 20. Yep. Uh, so I just turned 21 mm -hmm. and I got out after 30. Just after 30? Just after 30, yeah. So I want to go into like the experience within prison a little bit as well. Um, but before we do that, I mean, even just to fast forward a little bit, because we talked about how, you know, shit would have changed pretty quickly, you know, coming out. Like, I mean, 20s and we're similar age. I was born in 89, so a couple of years younger than yeah. you. But like things like smartphones, things like that. Non-existent at my time. Yeah, so you must've came out, yeah. like what was the perception it, like when you got so out? It's so funny how fast society just kind of evolved. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a time when you know, there was like CD players, uh, cassette tape, CD players, <laughs> MP3, and then like, <laughs> then all of a sudden went to smartphones and technology just went like that. It was like gradually going like this and then went like that, right? Mm -hmm. I missed that whole stage. Yep. Didn't know what an app was didn't know what a smartphone was, you know? <laughs> and someone trying to explain to me what an app was like, is that like a website? Like, what is it? Right, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Um, I remember just before I got out, a prison officer, um, he showed me an iPhone for the first time, mm -hmm. right? And he goes, there's a there's a lady called Siri on the phone that you could talk to. <laughs> and I was like, Are you fucking pulling my leg, seriously? I'm not that stupid, right? And he goes, ah, Siri, what the weather is. I was like, go get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and literally the officer goes, hey, Siri, what's the weather? And talk back, I was like, oh my God. Get yeah. fucked, are you serious? So and you just had a complete I did paradigm not know. shift. Yeah, I did not know. Like, But then again, we did have TV. Yep. So TV was the window to, to the world. Right. You know, but TV sometimes doesn't show you stuff like this, you know? Yeah. And I was just like, this is insane, mm. you know? And just technology, just even like security, you know, everything's, banking's done online. Mm. You know, um, you have to have emails set up, passwords, then like, then like, you know, phone confirmation, like message goes out, then the email comes. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? You know, so it was one of the most frustrating moments when I first got out was not knowing um, the norm of society, which was like everything was technology based mm. um, to have an existence in this world. 
you have to have some sort of tech. Yep. And, but that's what a lot of inmates face when they get out after doing a long time is they, they miss this whole stage, mm. you know, this era of technology. And like, it, it, if you don't have the right people to support you through that, like, you fall behind. Yeah. yeah. And that's part of, I imagine, confit in many ways. But going back to prison, okay, so you're 21 years old, you, um, you're arrested, and then you get sentenced for 13 years. Yeah. Uh, 12 years, 13 years? I was sentenced to 13, 13 years, years. But you did, did nine did years. Nine, yeah. Okay. So can you, I'd love to know what your first impression was, I guess, sort of getting into prison. Because you were a young guy, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, were you sort of one of the youngest? And what yeah, was that yeah. like? So that was, that was the first time I ever gone to prison, mm. right? Um, so when you first get locked up, they put you into a holding cell at the police station. Then they move you into um, like another place where they process you. And then from there you move off to a prison, right? Mm. But at that time, all the prisons were packed. There were no bed placements. Right. So they kept me at this place called Surrey Hills. Mm. So Surrey Hills, everyone knows where Surrey Hills is if you're from Sydney, mm. right? Uh, it's a very nice area, yep. but little do they know there are dungeons underneath Surrey Hills. Really? Okay. Yeah. So from, you know, where the police station is, Surrey Hills police Golden station. Yep. Yeah. So underneath there is a labyrinth of pris like the prison cells. Really? It's all glass. So it's all glass okay. and there's like hundreds of people down there, okay. right? And waiting to get processed. So this is something that the city does not know. <laughs> you know, normal people just, you know, like not knowing just walking past the street, but underneath there are all these people locked up. Yep. It is one of the worst places because 24 seven fluorescent light, that light doesn't go off. No natural light. No natural light, right? Mm. But you can hear the people up, upstairs, so it's a it's a oh, tease. Wow. You can hear all these people walking by laughing, us and chatting. laughing and chatting, and you're just stuck in this space. They give you one mattress, right? You get a shower once a week, mm -hmm. no toothbrush, nothing, right? Because it's not really a jail where they try to hold you for a long time. It's like you're meant to be there for a couple of days. You either go before the court in the local court to get bail. If you get bail refused, they'll send you to jail, right? right. But then they have to wait for a bed placement in jails, right? So normally you go to um, Silverwater mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you get locked in, but Silverwater was packed. Okay. I ended up going to Park Lee. Okay. So they sent me to Parkley Correctional Centre uh, after two weeks. But during that time, I stayed there two weeks. That's a very long time to mm -hmm. stay in the holding cell. I had one Indigenous guy that was like, as soon as I came in, he didn't move. I was there with one of my co-offenders. We came in um, and this guy literally for two days didn't move. He was just lying there, fetal position, looking towards the wall. And I was like, fuck, is this guy dead? So yeah. I told my co like, go, go kick him. So he <laughs> kicked him and he didn't move. I'm like, shit, is he dead? And we heard him like kind of snoring like, okay, he's just sleepy, probably like coming off the drugs or something. Yeah. Anyway, on the third day, me, me and my co were just literally mindlessly staring at the wall because that's all you do, right? Mm. Um, this guy just gets up. That guy just gets up and goes to the toilet. I mean, toilet as in a toilet is this metal toilet bowl yep. with like gangrene growing on it. <laughs> oh, so hygiene was like it's fucked like up. It's like fucking disgusting, right? Yeah. I wouldn't even go near that thing, yeah. right? But this guy went to the toilet, right? He needed to do a number two. So we're like, oh, let's give him some privacy. We turned around. Next thing you know, this guy's starting to like make all these weird noises and started screaming and we're looking at him. Do you know what bronzing is? No. He bronzed himself. What's that? He had his feces in his hand and started rubbing it. What? All over himself, over the walls, right? Because he, one, I think there was a lot of mental health issues yep. there, but two, it was just him trying to voice out, like, I want to get the fuck out like of here. It was all just like you know? pent up. Because apparently he was there for like another two weeks before us, so nearly a month. I don't know why they didn't move him. Right. There's something going on. Anyway, so these guys that are walking up to us and me and my are hugging each other, they go, get the fuck away. <laughs> Oh, so you guys were in the same, uh, like yeah, they, they got, there was no divide between yeah, you. So there's, there's like, they could put up to like four or five people in, in one. one. Yeah. yeah, but there's heaps of them. Like they're glass tanks and <sighs> it's a huge labyrinth of them like that goes all underneath Surrey Hills. Right. Yeah, so stayed there for two weeks. That happened. I was fucking traumatized. I'm like, oh my God, this is jail. <laughs> that wasn't even jail. <laughs> That this was, was a, that was wasn't even house. that was yeah. that wasn't even jail. That yeah. was like the holding cell before you go to jail. Right. Anyway, so they take you to prison, um, and then I went to park the. So it's like you know when you buy. I don't know if you have ever had a fish. <clears throat> you know when you buy a fish from the aquarium, mm -hmm. they have it in this. Plastic, plastic bag, bag right? yeah. then you put it in the tank just to acclimatize the temperature, mm -hmm. then you let them in. Mm -hmm. Felt like that. Right. So they put you in this little 
detox area. So mm-hmm. a lot of people coming off the drugs, mm-hmm. they put your detox for a couple of days and they move you into like a, like a newbie's wing, mm-hmm. right? And from there, they just kind of suss out if like you got mental health issues or got if it. you're going to be a problem. So they triage you according yeah, and to then, And then they transi- transition you into the main. So that okay. area was not bad because you come in with everyone. A lot of them are freshies. Mm-hmm. I was the second youngest. There was another guy that was 19 years old. Mm-hmm. So he was Vietnamese. So me and him just like connected straight away. Two yep. of the youngest guys yep. and we used to just like train and this kid was like a street smart kid as well. He knew, he, he I think he did juvie as well. So he knew a little bit about jail. So he's kind of like telling me, I'm just like, you know, fish You're out of water. I'm right? like fish out of water. Go, yeah, okay, tell me everything kind of yeah, thing, yeah, you know. Yeah. Then from there, they move you off <clears throat> into the main. And that was one of the most intimidating places or moments that, that I experienced. Like as you're moving into the main, you're grabbing your, you've got all your, your gear, like all your clothes mm-hmm. and you've got your blankets and all that kind of stuff and then move you in. And as you're walking into the yard, you see like fucking grown ass men. They're all like massive, right? Jacked, and they're yeah. all like training. They've got like guys on top of each other in squats. Mm. Like they've all got tattoos all on their faces mm. and they like, they all look mean, right? I'm just like, fuck man, I've hung around like, like criminals, mm. but this was like next level. Right, like prison is like cream of the crop of the of criminal course. world, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I was a young kid at the time and I went in and I was like, fuck, it is intimidating, but you know, you gotta kind of stand your ground. And that first week in, um, I'll never forget this. Cause like what happens is in jail, everyone sticks to their own own kind. Yep. So it's very racially segregated. Got it, okay. So if you're Asian, you stick with the Asians. If you're um, Aboriginal, you're with the Aboriginals. Muslims stay with the Muslims. Islanders with the Islanders. You know, it's, it's just a cultural thing, right? Mm. Um, and then the wing that I went to was run by the Muslims and the Aboriginals. Mm-hmm. There's no Asians. Asians in the working unit, which is in the next unit. To get okay. to the working unit, yeah. you have to stay there for two weeks put your name down, right? And then they, it's it's a privilege, to, they call it a privilege unit because you go there, you go to work, you make a bit of money, mm. you stay out of trouble in the yard. Yard is where all the trouble is, right? right. You wanna stay out of the yard, go to work and just do your time quickly. By the time you finish work, do your training session, whatever, quick, like have your meal and then you get locked in, mm. right? In the, this yard, there's no work. So just stuck out in the yard the whole day. You've got nothing to do. Nothing, to, everyone's yeah. just training, just they, 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 they're they taking drugs, gambling, a lot of fight. Literally there was like four or five fights going on every day, mm. you know? And me and my other mate, we were the only two Asians in that unit, right? And how this unit operated was, there's two phones in the yard, right? The Aboriginals own one phone, <laughs> the Muslims, own the other phone. Mm. If you don't belong, if you're not an Aboriginal or Muslim, you can't use that phone. Really? You can't call your lawyer, you can't call your family. So you've lost access basically. Lost access. Yeah. So I'm like, this is fucking bullshit. Mm. So there was one time, like with the with the Muslim boys, there's constantly guys going on the phone. With the Aboriginal boys, there's sometimes if there was gaps, no one was using the phone. Mm. So one time I just snuck on, I was like, fuck, I gotta call my lawyer ASAP. Mm. I gotta get out of here, right? Uh, I was still in that mindset. So I was trying to call my lawyer. Next thing I know, my shirt gets put over my head. Like they put my shirt over my head, someone starts laying into me, right? Mm. So I turn around and this this guy is like literally just half my size. I'm like, fuck this guy. I'm kicked him. Black belt taekwondo, <laughs> I kicked him in the head, knocked out, yeah. right? And then, oh my God, everyone, the whole yard just went quiet. Everyone just stood up. I was like, oh fuck, like I'm dead. They all started walking toward, all the Aboriginal guys started walking towards me yep. and then boom, the officer walks out and what's going on is nearly Musta and everyone's kind of like walked off. And then Musta is like um, where they, <clears throat> at lunchtime you get locked in for an hour. Yep. So they, it's not like the movies where you go to like a chow hall or whatever and everyone yeah, gets fed yeah. there. What they do is they come around with these trolleys, handle the meals in front of your cell, oh. pre-packed meals, yep. right? So they lock you in for an hour and you eat your meal in your cell and they let you out again. Okay. So, and they also muster you up so they know that everyone's there. It's like a head count. Gotcha. So during lunch, so it was that time. So everyone's now looking at me. I'm going, I'm fucking, they're going to kill me, right? Mm. So I've gone into my cell eating my food and my mate who's my cellmate, he's like, listen, get all the magazines, start strapping it around your body. Like it's body armor, just in case they just stab to, you, uh, it, it, it absorbs to, that impact, gotcha, right? Yep. So now I've got like magazines strapped around me. I'm shitting myself, yeah. right? I've got, oh my God. And then they scream, they're all screaming out the unit when they go, you're fucking dead. We're going to kill you when you come oh, so out. So you knew like it was coming. 
I knew. Yeah. That's the worst feeling ever. Like yeah. I had no protection, nothing. I just had a magazine strapped around me. I'm going, oh my God, I'm, that's it, I'm dead, I'm dead. Yeah. And my mate wasn't making it any better. He's like, oh look, I will use like a blade, like a razor blade <laughs> or something. Like, razor blade, what's a razor blade gonna do? Yeah. Anyway, to top it off, the Asian boys on in the other yard heard what happened, mm. right? <clears throat> so a sweeper comes out. So a sweeper is someone who, when everyone's locked in, they clean the they clean the unit. So he's an inmate that has a bit more trust, a bit more access to the unit. Mm. Anyway, he knocks on my door and puts a newspaper underneath. He goes, "This is from the boys from next door, mm -hmm. right?" I opened it up. I should, you know, a shank is so shank. What shank? It was a samurai sword. It was really the biggest piece of metal that I've ever seen. And he goes, this is protect yourself. If I use this, someone's dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was massive, yep. right? And I'm putting that down my pants. Now I'm thinking in my head, not only is the unit gonna all stab me, now if I retaliate, I'm probably gonna kill someone. You I'm gonna get done for murder. <laughs> I, I was in panic mode. I was like, fuck, what do I do? What do I do? This is the worst, mm -hmm. right? And like literally I went white. I was like, fucking hell, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And <clears throat> my mate's going, there's a, there's a button in the unit, mm -hmm. right? That you could buzz. So he goes, you could buzz that and they'll send you to protection. I was like, never. But he goes, if like you Like it was a pride thing? If, if you do that, he goes, you're probably gonna get stabbed anyway. Right, that's what you're my friend- You're just delaying the inevitable. Yeah, I didn't even know, yeah. right? So he goes, you're gonna get stabbed anyway. So I was like, fuck. Anyway, it's about let, let go time. Officers are coming around yeah. and the two people, he's like the manager of security, he comes up and he goes, Quan, pack your stuff, you're going next door now. I'm like, what? He goes, get your stuff, we're going next door. Mm. So I literally, even before everyone came out, they moved me next door. It was the Asian delegate at the time. He knew that there was no protection here. So he, 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 got he you went out. and talked to the officers and he goes, get this guy over, there's gonna be dramas. Wow. That's all they needed to know. Yeah. So they got me out of there. Okay. And I walked over with this samurai sword in my pants, <laughs> walked into the unit and I, I haven't eaten any proper food. Literally till then I was eating like bread with like, you know, like margarine on it, mm. watching food safari on SBS, <laughs> saliva, <laughs> starving. And as soon as I came into that unit, the, Viet, the Vietnamese boys, they had boom meal ready for me. Wow. Yeah, like ja feast ja ready for jail you. made boom meal. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck? I've never had this before, but it was the best. I could wash my face in that soup. That's how, <laughs> that's how good it was, you know? Yeah, and that was my first kind of intro into jail, man. Right, and they and, brought you in basically. And as soon as I came in, everyone kind of gave me like, good on you for standing your ground and- So you earned respect basically yeah, by yeah, doing yeah, that. Yeah, and I came in and then like they, they kind of like my saving grace. Right. Yeah. And what were the subsequent, I mean, I, I know the story and, and maybe I'll fill that gap a little bit and you can sort of elaborate on it is from, from you entering prison and then spending your next nine years into it, um, you, you tell the story of basically meeting this, basically, I think it was like a million, it was done for like a white collar crime yeah, basically, yeah. right? So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about where that came about and give us a timeline? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, towards the start of my sentence, still very young headed, you know, um, I knew what I was looking at. And I was like, you know what? There's no hope for me. Uh, I'm gonna be a career criminal for the rest of my life. Mm. And so all I was doing was networking with other criminals, how to be a better criminal, right? <laughs> it, they call jail or prison, the university of criminals. Right. You go there, you find out what technology or the police are using. You see how everyone got arrested or how they got done or what investigation methods they were using. And so you, you become more knowledgeable about how, so to, be a, when you get how out. to be a smarter criminal, yeah. right? It still doesn't help, <laughs> you know? Then you start networking with other criminals, mm. other other crews, other organizations. So you kind of get in with them. So you just like, it's like business, right? But illegal, illegal yep. business, right? So I'm thinking in my head, yep, I'm gonna be a career criminal for the rest of my life. Then, you know, I had all these guys that I was like looking up to, they were like these international drug lords. You know, a lot of them, you know, they were traveling around on their own yachts, mm. you know, bringing in like cocaine mm. and some of them were using like submarines because they're connected with the, <laughs> it was a drone submarine. Wow. Yeah. yeah, Connected with the cartels and mm. some big time players, yeah. right? So I'm thinking, man, I want to learn from these guys, you know? So I started networking with them and, and I found out that they've spent more than half their life all in jail in and out, in and out, in and out, right? And I was like, if you guys are like meant to be the 007s of the criminal world, how come you did so Why much jail time? time yeah. And you know what they said to me? They go, there's no guarantee in this game. Mm. There is no such thing as guarantee. Mm. If you don't expect to get caught one day, then you're living in La La Land doing this job. Right. 
you know. So I was like, fuck, I can't, I can't see myself doing another decade, you know, mm. or close to a decade. I'm pretty sure if I get caught again, it's mm. double digits. Mm. You know, I'm already going to do nearly, nearly a decade. Mm-hmm. You know, then not, not mate, another double digit. That's it. Uh, then my life's over, right? Mm. So I was like, man, like, what, what am I going to do? And I kind of looked. I wanted to change. I wanted to do something different, right? And this was an thought that went on for years and years. I want to do something different, I want to change. But living in that environment, your mind gets so retracted to just what's in that yard, what everyone talks about. So you you, you know, there's a saying, you are your environment. Yep. You are the, uh, the product of the closest five friends or whatever, right? Um, and that, that was jail, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I was like, man, I want to do something different. I want to do something different in my life. And one thing I realized was, the reason why everyone was incarcerated, not only was it, you know, due to some sort of, um, you know, disadvantage or some sort of childhood trauma, mm-hmm. it, it was the lack of education. Mm-hmm. You know, I dropped out of school in year 10. So I only had a, like, education up to year 10 mm-hmm. and everyone else had no education. There was like literally a handful of people, maybe three people that I met in jail that had a university education. Right out of like thousands, right? right? I'm just like, there's got to be something here. Why isn't anyone educated? I had a 60 year old, this is how sad it is. I had a 60 year old guy who was in the cell next door, right? Who couldn't read or write, right? And during Christmas, you get locked in. All day you get locked in because there's staff shortage. Yep. Every year during Christmas, it's just a whole day lock in, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the sweepers are going around sending letters, giving letters out to- From the families bo- and stuff? Yeah, so they yeah. go out and put it under their cell. Yeah. So you get to read it while you're locked in, right? This old man could not read a letter, a Christmas card from his daughter and his granddaughter. And he had to wait till the next day and ask me to read the oh, letter fuck, for him. so sad. You know, yeah. and I was just like, I, obviously I know how to read and stuff, but that was like an extreme example. But I was like, I don't want to be like this. I want to educate myself. I want to do something different. Maybe this is a way out for me, right? Mm. So I started reading this book one day, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, by oh, Robert, Robert Kiyosaki. Kiyosaki. Yeah, yeah. And in the book, he talks about how accounting is the language of business. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm a bit of a hustler. I know, I know illegal business, but I want to educate myself on this legitimate business. Mm. Maybe I should teach myself accounting. How hard can it be, <laughs> right? So I went to the prison library, got myself a first year, like university accounting textbook. I opened it up. I was just looking and going, what the fuck is this shit? You know, it, looked, it literally looked like Egyptian hieroglyphics <laughs> to me, right? Um, and I was like, fuck, I, can't, I don't understand that fucking single thing in here. I must be so stupid, right? And I got full depressed. I was like, oh my God, what was I thinking trying to educate myself, right? I was sitting in the yard. This is a Lithgo maximum security, right? When this happened. That exact same day, call it fate or call it luck, whatever you want to call it. This is the craziest thing. That exact same day, this guy walks into the yard, right? Mm-hmm. He had like a bruised eye, right? <clears throat> and he, he wasn't in a good way. And the rumor was that he's a billionaire accountant. Right. He got arrested for Australia's largest tax fraud. Right. Right. Okay. So he was a former uh, partner for tax mm-hmm. at one of the big four accounting firms. Okay. And then he made his money through mining, mm-hmm. had his own pharmaceutical company, mm-hmm. and he was a billionaire, right? right? Mm-hmm. But when you get to that level, sh- shit happens mm-hmm. anyway. He's now in, in the main, like he wasn't even put in protection. They put him in the main. Oh, it was just general population. General population. Okay. And everyone knew he was a billionaire. Yep. Accountant. Yep. Everyone heard billionaire. All I heard was accountant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I approached him and I was like, hey dude, <clears throat> listen, I'm gonna give you a proposal, right? That you can't refuse. Uh, I'll give you the protection. No one's gonna let, lay a finger on you, mm-hmm. right? Everyone's gonna be sweet with you. In return, you teach me accounting. And he was looking at me going, you fucking crazy? <laughs> like who the hell? <laughs> Everyone's, hitting me, you up. Everyone's <laughs> hitting me up for money and yeah. you're asking me for accounting accounting tutorial lessons, right? right? Anyway, we ended up, not long after we ended up becoming cellmates. Mm. And not only did he hold his end of the bargain and teach me accounting every day, but he taught me about business. He taught me about the value of education and most importantly taught me about self-worth. Mm. You know, And today, because of that, I had to understand that what I was worth, my self-worth to be able to mentor other young people. That's why we run our charity going into youth justice centers because it was that one mentor who helped me to change my perception on life, mm. right? And now we're going back into youth justice centers to help these young people to have that switch in their mind as well. That it starts with self-worth, starts mm. with support. You can do it, mm. you know? 
I honestly thought since I was young, I thought I was the dumbest. Like I'm Asian, Asians are meant to be good at like studying and stuff. I, I'm missing some sort of Asian chromosome. <laughs> I sort of crumbles. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I didn't have that. I just didn't have it. But all I needed was that right motivation. That someone to believe in you as well. Someone to believe saying that mm. you can do it, you know, because I never had that growing up, mm. you know, and that was the only thing. It wasn't money. It wasn't anything else. It was for me to be believing myself to be able to do it myself. Mm. You know, that was the key. And that's what we're doing to these young people in, in the justice system. It's fitness-based programs but what we're really doing is to try and switch their mindset around stuff. This episode is produced and brought to you by Social Wave. Social Wave is a strategic content marketing agency helping businesses grow revenue using video, podcasts, and SEO. Head on over to socialwave.com.au to find out more. Now back to the show. So in a lot of ways, I guess vi- fitness is the vehicle, but it's more about the lessons within 100%, 100%. that. 100%. So this guy sounds like almost like a father figure for you in many yeah, ways. Yeah, was. Right. Actually, it was yeah, yeah. And you talk about self worth and how he helped you about self worth. What was it? I mean, can you share some of the things that he taught you about self worth? Like, what were the things he said? <clears throat> yep. So it's not about the things he said. It's the things that he helped me to realize. Okay. Right. So when we were sellies, he was talking about his business ventures, his uh, travels around the world, and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? Like, I was doing that when I was doing illegal business. Right. Right. And he was helping me to do like, he was helping me in the study. So if just from the basics, right. Like, like literally the basic maths, right. He was showing mm. me basic maths. Um, then he got me to do study for my HSC, which mm-hmm. I passed, you know, and I was like, shit, what the hell? He actually helped me to finish a really, really difficult book, mm. you know, like textbook. And he guided me through it. I was like, what the hell? Like I, I finished, I never started something and finished anything in my life. Got it. He yeah. goes, he's taught one lesson he taught me was, it's easy to start, hard to finish. Mm. Even university goes to me, it's easy to start, hard to finish. Mm. You know, so I did my HSC and I enrolled into university because of him, I ended up getting to accepted, I ended up getting accepted into university as well. Mm. But it was just those lessons, like start something, put everything in, to it, you know, um, and that's where we t- also teach the principle of being grounded. Just do the best that you can in any given moment. But he made like learning fun as well. So we're just like bagging each other out and <laughs> while we're studying. I think it's like having that right type of mentor to uh, help you to find a passion in something, mm. but that in- yep, instilling that self-belief, getting me to do the small thing first, one thing, and then a bigger thing. Okay, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. Yeah. You know? So I think he, he helped you I guess in a lot of ways, if what I'm hearing correctly is he's he's helped you realize that you're more capable than you actually think you are. Cause you had yeah. like a belief or an identity that you you weren't smart or you yeah, couldn't study right. or things that's like right. that, right? So self-inflicted belief. Yeah. Correct, exactly. Self-limiting belief self-limiting. in a lot of ways. That's from childhood. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually just whilst, you know, doing a bit of research leading up to our interview as well, um, I think there was an article um that was written about you and there was an interview with you. And you said during this whole process, you know, growing up, uh, prison, um, running a crime syndicate and all this stuff, you've always been quite um, not apathetic, but like not so emotional about the whole thing because you're like, this is the card I've been dealt. This is life. But when you finally graduated university, you said that seeing that sort of graduation paper was the first time that you really emotionally broke down because of that. So are you able to sort of tell me a bit about that? It wasn't the graduation paper. Oh, what was Um, it? So- while I was in prison, I was, you know, like I said, I thought, you know, I was absolutely dumb, right? Mm. And I couldn't do this kind of stuff. Mm. It was that process of learning, growing. Then I ended up detaching. So we, me and my mentor, we ended up going to different prisons. So yep. I was staying at Wellington Correctional Center. And um, this is like about a year later, year and a half later. And I'm sitting in the yard playing cards with the boys. And then this prison officer walks straight up to me and he hands me this letter and he goes, Quan. I don't know how you did it, but you fucking did it, mate. And I was like, what are you going on about? So out of curiosity, I took that letter into my cell and I opened it up and it was this emblem. And then it goes, congratulations, you've been admitted into the university. Oh, so it was an you acceptance suffered. letter. It was the acceptance letter. Ah. And literally, you know, I remember when I got sentenced, you know, and going through all that like bullshit you go through in jail, right? Mm-hmm. It breaks people. Yep. It does. I. Like, it mentally breaks a lot of people. You know, people go crazy in jail. And through all that process, you know, getting treated like second class citizen by the officers and mm. and you know, just dealing with just crap, just seeing just inhumane stuff, right? I never shed a tear. 
even when I got sentenced as well, you know, because I accepted that this is the consequence of my actions. But when I read that letter, literally I broke down in tears because mm. no one understood what this acceptance letter meant. Mm. This was my freedom. Mm. This is my ticket to change my life. Mm. That's what it meant for me, you know? And I was holding that letter in, my, in that cell and I broke down into tears because this was my gateway out of here, out, out of this life, mm. you know? And I believed in that. And it did, it worked out. And when I went to university, you know, I did my degree and ended up um, finding out what a social enterprise was. And um, when I first went, you know, I still remember the first month, the first month I got out, after the first month, I went straight into UNSW, mm -hmm. ended up doing this course called Creating Social Change. And in that, in that subject, um, the lecturer was talking about like recidivism rates and disadvantaged communities in mm. Australia. And mm. I was like, fuck, this is my shit. I know yeah, all this yeah. stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, re I reached out to the lecturer after and I was like, listen, listen I just got released from Long Bay Jail last month. <laughs> uh, great lecture, by the way. And she was looking at me going, <laughs> are you even a student in my class? I was like, yeah, I'm a first year student and um, I've got this business idea. Can you help me out? You know, mm. so she introduced me to Center for Social Impact mm. uh, who's based at UNSW and a few other universities and mm. they put my me onto a case study for an MBA program. Wow, okay. And I had MBA students working on my idea to formulate what Confit is today, oh. a social enterprise with the mission to reduce recidivism through fitness. You know, and I, it started from there. And that same lecturer, believe it or not, she's one of our board directors. Is this Natalie Charity. O? Ali, uh, Ali, no, Ali Walker. Ali Walker. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Well, Natalie O was a name that popped up a few times. Yes. Um, can you tell us a bit about her? Because I found it quite interesting. What yeah, she was Natalie on. O. So um, she is one of the senior lecturers. Um, she, so she's the head of banking and finance at UNSW. Mm. And she helped so many inmates get into UNSW. Mm -hmm. So even with my application process, so Natalie O, um, like she believed that there, there, are, there are these inmates who have potential. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna mention names because of um, privacy issues, mm -hmm. but there are certain um, inmates who went through Natalie O who got accepted into UNSW, who one is an investment banker. Wow. One is a lawyer. Yep. All right. Another one is a chartered accountant. Um, and then you got myself who is, <laughs> is a social entrepreneur. Um, yeah. And it's just, you know, Natalie created pathways for us to get an education and she believed in us. And that's all we needed was that one pathway. And we mm. just, we just did the rest, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And now Confit today, um, you talk about both Confit and Confit pathways as well. Um, are you able to sort of rattle off numbers? Because I think um, even for someone like myself, I don't quite sort of can wrap my head around the magnitude of what you guys are doing in terms of just impact and how many lives maybe you're potentially influencing. Yep. Um, I, I see it maybe on a social media level um, when you guys are you know posting about things, but is there some stuff that you can yeah, share? Yeah, 100%. So currently right now in Australia, <clears throat> the recidivism statistics, so rate of reincarceration yep. for young people, it's 84% within the first 12 months, 60% within the first six months. Okay. So that's young people coming out of youth justice space. It costs to house one young person in custody each year, $511,000, so more than half a mil to house one young person in custody each year. Yep. That's a lot of money. That's, that's taxpayers' a, dollars? That's a lot of taxpayer dollars. Yeah, right, okay. You know, um, for adults, uh, it costs $113,000 to house a single person yep. because we're talking about volume now because the amount of, people like at one at one time I think there's only like a bit of a maybe thousand something I'm not hundred percent of mm. the number but it's smaller it's like in the in this low thousands mm. where young people are incarcerated mm. adults at one time it's gonna be forty four thousand across Australia oh, you know so okay. that's the difference there's more mm. money I guess like um the uh, the money spreads out a little bit more, yep. you know, uh, with the adults. Yep. Uh, and with the adults, you know, the recidiv recidivism rate is 54% within the first two years of their release. Still pretty high. Yeah, Still one pretty, two, it's yeah. a failure rate. Yeah, it's yeah, a failure yeah. rate. Yeah. So we currently with the not-for-profit that we're running, uh, we run mentoring programs mm. in 
four or five of the six youth justice centers across New South Wales. Yep. So we do two regional, three uh, metropolitan. Mm -hmm. um, the only reason we don't do the sixth one is it's so bloody far away in Akmina. We, Akmina is in Grafton. It's okay. closer to the Queensland border. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, got it. So we can't run effective programs. Mm. And out of that, <clears throat> uh, we so far to date since 2001, when we started running our programs, we've had 1,560 or 70 something young people that went through our wow. program. Okay. Yeah, and out of that, 70% of those people who went through our program mm. have continued to receive mentoring support through us in the community. Mm. And through that, I don't know the exact number, but how many got employed, I don't know the exact number, but we do have employment partners where um, that's not our specialty, yep. but we introduce them to um, employment partners in rail, hospitality, construction, marketing um, for these young people, whatever they're interested in, yep. whether they need the money, whether mm. they want to learn a skill, mm. we introduce them to these um, employment partners Mm -hmm. And then we've also got educational partners with TAFE, Australian Institute of Fitness, and also our partnership with Uni University of New South Wales. Mm -hmm. So the uni now provides full scholarships to young people that are coming through our program mm -hmm. um, and they get campus accommodation as mm -hmm. well. You know, so we've got two young people doing university at the moment. Currently. Nice. Nice. So, and then of course, I think you've got big plans about sort of growing this to be even bigger. So what's been, I guess, the challenge with growing something like this? Because I imagine you sort of need to scale it with people yep. um, in the stuff so you do. So people is always going to be <clears throat> uh, a difficult one, especially mm. for us when we need to, we can't just put an ad out there and go, hey, if you're this type of person, come. Hey, if you're criminal. <laughs> no, no, the, yeah. Literally yeah. the criteria to join our team, mm. you have to have done prison, yep. right? You couldn't have been the protection. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be in the main, right? You have to have done prison time, <clears throat> change your life around, you have to be into fitness, be able to talk and mentor. Mm. Um, it's we're really refining that yeah. selection criteria, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's very hard to find these individuals. So to grow our team, like when we find someone, we grab onto them yep. and we give them all the support that we can give yep. because we want them, right? We want them to stay. Uh, another issue is even if we find these individuals, it's getting that working with children's check. In Australia, all right, every state and territory has different criteria. Mm -hmm. Like in Queensland, they call it the blue card. In New South Wales, they call it like working with children's check. Mm -hmm. It's a check that you go through the, um, the children's guardian, mm -hmm. which gives you like a certificate to work with children. Mm -hmm. if without that, you can't. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these inmates who have violent charges, prior violent charges as well, they can't get these checks. Yep. Um, New South Wales is the most lenient, like somewhere like Queensland, if you've been in jail, they won't even give it to it's you. It's just a black and white thing. Yeah, it's crazy. Right. So like for us to go interstate as well, like how do we get past these checks? Because then we can't work with children, Yep. you know? And studies show that peer-to-peer -peer support, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring yep. works. And lived experience is peer to peer, mm. you know, and why our program works so much is the fact that we can relate and like connect with the young people straight away when we come and they go, oh, they've done jail time as well, they're one of us. Mm. That's the only reason why our program's so successful because like, we just relate, then we can offer the mentoring yep. because we've got the same mindset, yep. you know, and, but that's been a challenge to find the right people. When we do find the right people, can they get the check? You know, how do you mm. grow like that? How do you grow into interstate as well? Yep. Um, we got a down pack in New South Wales, but just going to other states is going to be a bit more difficult. Yeah, just because it's not nationalized. Yeah, like yeah, you've got yeah. to go case by case. Yeah. Does that mean you have to do a lot of lobbying, I guess, with, you know? Uh, we, we have tried in the past, um, but we're trying to look for other avenues yeah. right now. So our only way is just to find the right people. Um, so what we're doing now is to run programs inside corrections. So we're running fitness programs inside corrections. We're running in four corrections at the moment mm -hmm. um, to find the right type of candidates. Mm. Instead of finding candidates out in the community, let's find them when they're all clustered in jail. Yep. Uh, and there's more of them so we can slowly find more people like that. Yep. Um, at the same time, we're providing education for inmates through Cert 3, Cert 4, yep. through TAFE, Australian Institute of Fitness, and then we provide employment pathways for them in the fitness industry when they get out straight out of jail. Got it. So you're sort of working around the problem yep. at the moment, but yep. hopefully at a certain yep, stage, right. you'll be able yeah. to work around it. I had a question here, which um, might be a bit of a loaded one is why do, what, what does broader society get wrong about people who've gone to prison? You know, like, I think there's a stigma for there sure. Definitely is a stigma. Yeah. Um, Look, I think it all stems from what they know. Mm. It comes from a little bit of ignorance. And also like, you know, I, I don't blame people for judging people for the heinous crimes, crime acts that some of these inmates have committed, mm. right? But one thing I want society to understand is not everyone are like Ivan Malats. 
Uh, you know, they're not all serial killers. Mm. You know, I, I understand there are some like really bad people in jail that I believe that should never be let out, mm -hmm. right? But that is a very, very small minority. Rest people literally stem from like, like some sort of trauma and a lot of them come from disadvantage. You know, a lot of these acts, a lot of these crimes are committed because of um, the drug dependency or substance abuse mm. dependency. And they go, they're all junkies and they should all go to jail because they're doing these petty crimes. But uh, what I'm trying to advocate for is like, well, why did these people end up in this first place? You know, a lot of these people, right, were, had no family growing up as a child, mm -hmm. right? Then some of them were sexually abused, you know, and through that they want to mask their pain through drugs and that led to another like, Coping mechanisms. I just need people mm. to understand, don't just judge the individual for the crime that they did. Mm. Yes, they did the crime and they're going to do the time and they're paying for those that, that crime through, mm. through jail time, right? Mm. But please do not ridicule them and continue that sentence for them out in the society because they've done jail time mm. um, you know, and have lack of opportunities mm. because of just that one mistake that they made. You know, um, but please understand that there, some of these individuals, there are deep seated root causes for why they, what led them to doing that act, mm. you know? Um, so I just want society to understand that a little bit better <laughs> than just judging people. Oh, why did he steal that? He's a thief, but maybe there might be something more to it. Yep. You know, let's understand that root causes, yep. you know? Um, and you know, Scandinavia, they do it really well. So in the developed Western country, mm. we have this idea of punishment, right? When you do something wrong, let's punish people. Mm. Let's punish them for their actions, mm. right? And that's always been, that like punishment has always been the answer um, since God knows when, like the beginning of days, you know? Yep. But change research shows that punishment does not work. If you want to rehabilitate someone, but you're punishing them, doesn't work. It just shows that there's so much research behind it, mm. right? Mm. And in Scandinavia, they they picked up on this, right? And what happened was in Scandinavia, in Scandinavia, twenty years ago, they had the same concept, like every other developed Western country. You do the crime, it's like here's a criminal, give him stale bread, lock him up, throw away the keys. Mm. You know, he's he's a scum of society. That was their mentality and thought, mm. right? But someone did some research and they came back and they realized that, you know, in Scandinavia, they've got the highest taxes, right? Yep. Found a way to minimize tax. <laughs> that was the intention, was it? Or, no, 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 <laughs> do, no, this is a way to kind of get society to accept it, right? Right. Wasn't oh, min was it wasn't, yeah, it yeah, wasn't yeah. to minimize their tax, yep. but it was like, we can use uh, cost savings, mm -hmm. right? To implement these uh, into like health, education, mm -hmm. better things, like future of your children, mm -hmm. right? Which seem more appealing, right? And how they did that was, okay, there might be a bit more investment at the start, but there's gonna be little money going into the prison system. Mm -hmm. And through that, they were able to get the get society on board, mm -hmm. right? And also it showed that, you know, rehabilitation um, is much better long-term for the actual inmate. Um, in the future. So and this is what they did. So in, in jail, like we in the Western, developed Western world, we work like slaves, mm -hmm. right? And you get minimum wage. And the thing is, oh, at least you're out of the yard. Mm -hmm. In Scandinavia, they actually open up bank accounts for you, right? You get paid award wage, industry award wage, like outside, okay. yep. and they put that money into your bank account. In the Western world, you, taxpayer money goes on to feeding inmates. That's mm -hmm. a lot of money. Feeding 44,000 inmates, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. In Scandinavia, what they do is they've created these IGA style shopping malls, ah. right? Where inmates can go and purchase food with their credit card with the money that they earn, right? In Australia, it costs money to house these inmates in cells, right? Gotcha. In Scandinavia, they get inmates to pay their own rent. So they're self-sufficient. They're normalizing life, yes. which it should be like that. Right. Mm. Why do people come out institutionalized? Because every you're fed, everything is, you're told what to do. Mm. Um, it's provided by the system. Mm. Whereas over here, you work, you get paid. You educate yourself, you get paid, mm. right? So you got to keep this like kind of like um, average mark. Mm. So you educate yourself, you get mm. paid. Because by educating someone, it just shows that these guys will go and get a good job when they mm. get out because they've got the qualifications, mm. right? 
So you educate yourself, you get paid. You buy your own food, mm-hmm. right? You cook your own food in the unit, mm-hmm. right? And then you pay rent. And some people even pay victims comp with the money that they earn. Wow. Okay. It's self-sufficient. Okay. There is l- like not much money going into the system, mm. right? And they're all about rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. So the culture between inmates and staff right? It's so good. Over there, they're not even considered prison staff. They're like caseworkers, psychologists. So the label is is important as well. Yeah. 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 I think that was the key. Whereas in the developed Western world, there is a very toxic relationship between staff and Mm. um, inmates. Mm -hmm. So we call them screws. Mm. I don't know where that word came from, but maybe Mm. because they screw our life. (laughs) (laughs) But they just call screws, right? And it is toxic. Like you even talk to a screw, you're labeled as a dog. Right. So we don't even talk to them, right? And vice versa, they treat you like scum of society. They, mm. they, they call you crims. Mm. They're like, he's a crim, get mm. that crim out of here. Mm. Like they even just that, that labeling crim, mm. you know, like it sticks in your head, you know? So that's the culture, that's the culture difference, mm. you know? And they, pro, in Scandinavia, they promote education, they mm. promote like, they already think that being taken away from society is punishment enough. Mm-hmm. You know, so they're still in jail, yep. you know, that's punishment enough. Whereas in the developed Western world, they're thinking, oh, inmates should go to jail and rot in there, away, yeah. get raped and bashed mm. and all that kind of stuff, you mm. know? Um, and that's the kind of difference. That's a, that's a mentality difference because at the end of the day, this is what I advocate. 99% of inmates will eventually get out mm-hmm. and be a part of society, mm. right? Would you rather want someone that is rehabilitated, educated, ready to work and be a contributing member to society? Or would you rather want someone that could be potentially your next door neighbor, right? Someone who hates the world, Mm. who only knows crime and he's got nothing but violence and hatred inside of him Mm. towards the government, towards the system, towards other people. Who do you want? Like it's it's just, it's just, it's a no brainer, Mm. right? And that's what society is creating by saying, just knock them up. They're not thinking long-term. They're not thinking these people are eventually going to get let out, mm. you know? Um, and over there in Scandinavia, their recidivism rate is like 20%. Wow. Okay. You know? And the people that do go back are the ones that are substance abuse issues, yeah. you know? Yeah. So <clears throat> that's a different system. So do you think it's possible for Australia to have, or even just New South Wales to have something like this? I feel like it could work, yeah. but it would take a lot of time. It'd be a systematic change. It, it would It would be a long, slow transition. Yeah. But I know right now the government's really like trying to change. Like I remember when I came back from Scandinavia, yeah. I, I ran, I'm glad that I know how to run fitness programs because <laughs> I, w- I went to Scandinavia to run fitness programs for the inmates. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I came back, they, they, they even let me take a video like camera inside. I videotaped the whole thing, wow. took photos of the whole thing. Yep. And and the government saw my post on LinkedIn yep. and they were like, when you come back, let's have a meeting. I wanted to- Yeah, right. This was your, like the state government or- This is the state government. Right. Yeah, pick your brains about some of the stuff that yep. you saw in the youth justice centers over there. Yep. When I went there, there was zero young people in youth justice. And I was like, how do you justify running this place? Because, yeah. Oh, just in case someone gets locked up and comes in. Oh. I was just like, what the fuck? That makes no sense. Yeah, but yeah. there was zero, that, that's how good they are. They, they don't like to lock kids up. Mm-hmm. So in Australia, um, we lock kids as young as 10 years old. Mm-hmm. You know, like 10 years, I, have, I don't know if any of these listeners, any of your listeners have kids. If, if you see the mindset of a 10 year old, mm-hmm. what it's like, they're, mm-hmm. they're children, mm-hmm. right? Um, over there in Scandinavia, minimum age of criminal responsibility is 17. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's different. Yep. You know, they, they don't lock up little kids because when you lock up a little kid, you're just creating a cycle of them. Like yeah, you're throwing cycle. gasoline onto the fire, yeah, right? Yeah, keep on coming back in. Absolutely. Know? I've got a bit of a left field turn a little bit, if you don't mind, is yeah. um, you talked about your, your mum at the beginning. What is your relationship like with your mum throughout that journey? And then what is it like now? Good question. Um, I feel like, you know, we've, uh, my mom and I have always been close because that was the only family that I had. Mm. Uh, growing up in Australia, I just, I didn't have anyone else except for my mom, you know, we we're quite close. Then when I went to jail, I felt like, you know, I became a different person as well. Mm. Um, the only person that was actually there for me throughout the whole process is, is your mom. Mm. And was my mom. I remember when I first got arrested, I told all the boys, because I was living in Australia. Mum was living in Korea at that time. So she got right. remarried yep. and she moved to Korea. She moved back to Korea. She yeah. moved back to Korea. Yep. 
and I got arrested and normally I'll, you know, I'll call my mum, you know, every third day, you know, one, once a week or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Communication stopped and my mum knew I was kind of in that world. Yeah. And she probably thought I got buried in a ditch somewhere. Really? You know? Yeah, okay. <laughs> because like, I just went communication silent. Right. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. right? So she flew down to Australia and she was like asking all my friends, where's Joe, where's Joe? I told all my friends, do not tell my mum because in my head I'm still thinking I'm going to get bail. Like, you know, in Asian culture, you go to prison. It, it's like a shame it's thing. It's shame, yeah. right? Like, you know, like all the parents talk about, yeah, yeah. you know, like, you know, what school your kid went to, what selective school your kid <laughs> went to. I already brought my mom enough shame by like not going to any school, you know? <laughs> yeah. But like, I just didn't want anyone to know about this either because I'm thinking in my head, oh, let's put some money together. Hopefully I could get, I could pay for bail and get out of here, mm. which I all got bail refused anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was about two months Two months in, maybe a bit over two months, mm. you know, my mom went to my best friend and she literally got on her knees and started begging, where's son? Like, where's my son? If he's dead, I want to know. Yeah. And my friend's like, man, I'm sorry, I can't do that to your mom, man. She was like a mother to me as well. So he had so to he, tell her. So he told her and then literally I'm thinking it's one of the boys visiting me. I'm walking out with a smile on my face. I had a bruised eye at the time because I was getting into fights. <laughs> bruised eye, busted up, limb. going out, my mom's sitting out there going, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah. And this is how strong she is, right? Yeah. So like the whole time she just goes, are you okay? You're eating okay? I'm mm. like, she didn't ask me what happened. And she's just like- She's really stoic yeah, about she's it. She's just like, look, as long as you're okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get you out of this situation. She's mm. very positive about everything, mm. right? And like, she is just like strong. So I was like, yeah, cool. So after the visit, I was walking out and like, before you get let out, like they, they put all the visitors into this like, like a holding room and they mm. let everyone out at the same time. Mm. And as I was walking out, I looked back and I could hit, see my mom just crying. All right. And I was like, fuck, she held it for me, you know? So mm. went out, I was like, fuck, man, I can't, I can't disappoint my mom again like this, you know? So <clears throat> so we still got a good relationship. Mm. Um, yes, as busy as I am, my mom's overseas, but we're still, there's a, uh, every morning, first thing, you know, we're all, uh, every second day we're talking to each other, mm. FaceTiming, so we still got a good relationship. And does she know now what you're doing? Like, is there much, oh, yeah. yeah? She doesn't so she, know like the details the, of yeah. everything, but she knows I'm doing something good. So she's proud. So once everything kind of like, I'm, I'll talk about the gym as well, but once everything kind of unfolds, mm. I'd love to invite my mom to help her to understand exactly what I do. Yeah, just know? to touch and feel and actually yeah, yeah. see it as she well. Did, I, t- I told this morning, I'm like, I'm going to do a podcast. She's like, what's a podcast? <laughs> My career's not that great, but uh, it's like we sit around and just talk in front of a mic and she's like, what's the point of that? <laughs> Such an Asian parent reaction as well. As long as it's good, all right? Let's like, yeah, keep doing podcast? it. <laughs> well, talk, speaking of the gym and like, I didn't know this until, you know, you walked into the building and we were talking about it is yeah. we're here in North Parramatta and you're opening up a gym in Parramatta, Parramatta as well. Yeah. So w- tell us a little bit about that. So we had two different organizations, which mm. was a social enterprise and the charity. Um, and I was like, how do I morph these together? Right, so now I've created a hybrid model, mm. right? So where the employees are working between the two organizations. Um, so we decided to open up a gym in Parramatta. So what would, what the whole idea of the gym is to have uh, young people coming through our program yep. to have continuous mentoring through fitness and stuff and have a place for them that's safe, mm-hmm. but it's not like a PCYC. I was just, I was thinking PCYC no, right then and there. No, no, yeah, no. Okay. So this is from like a social impact side, right? There's yep. a commercial side to it as well. Okay. Then we've got adults who are coming out the system. So they're going to use that space to have training. Mm-hmm. So maybe they might be able to shadow mm-hmm. some of our classes yep. and for a place where they can get educated, so upskilled mm-hmm. uh, in becoming a better fitness trainer, right? So that's like kind of like the, the social impact side, mm-hmm. right? The commercial side is where kind of like if you wanted to compare, I hate comparing to F45, but kind of like an F45 class-based model, right? Yep. Where inmates are the coaches, or we're providing um, group training classes. Got it. But think about it as kind of pres- like prestigious. Yep. So it's not like your F40. So you're going to have like really, really top of the notch, like 
equipment. Mm. Uh, we're going to have a wellness area. We've got infrared saunas, ice baths, um, you know, normal nice. tech compression pants, yep. you know, so the area like that. So downstairs is going to be a boxing area. Mm. So we do anything from group classes to technical boxing as well. Mm. Uh, so aqua bags, boxing ring, you've got the heavy bags and, you know, wow, most, okay. most of the guys are like- Sounds like a big gym as well. It's a 500 square meter, oh, okay. double Solid story. Size, yeah. yeah. So mm. the proceeds from the gym memberships are mm. going to go into our social course. Got it. So instead of the charity always going, trying to go for grants and all that kind of stuff, it's like, well, why can't we self-sufficient? Yeah. So we'll pay our trainers wait, uh, salary. Yep. So they'll be at the gym yep. and working over two different things. So we're still doing the in, in custody mentoring. Mm. They'll run the programs and the classes at the gym. Um, and what differentiates us from every other gym, you're gonna laugh, but it's brilliant. So we have an actual prison gate installed at reception. Right? What? And we're calling it a config correctional facility, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. And yep. have you ever seen, have you ever done an escape room? Yes. There's an escape room. Have you ever seen Survivor? Yes. And you had to do Survivor challenges? Yeah, yeah, All yeah, right. Yeah. Now, listeners, listen up. <laughs> Corporates, sporting teams, schools, team building challenges, right? So it is all fitness based. Nice. Eventually you have to escape prison, which is our front reception, <laughs> right? But it is, uh, it, we've, we've trialed this on Google already. Mm. So we've um, tried this concept without any equipment, but just the concepts. Mm. So it's about problem solving through fitness. It's about team challenges. So got you it. can't do it by yourself. You gotta have certain people, like amount of people awesome. to do with you. Yep. There are things where you get blindfolded and someone has to guide you through fitness diff, um, exercises and movements yep. while you're blindfolded. You know, there are different things. There's, there's a lot of different games that we come up with, mm. right? But what it what what the whole point of this is to also advocate to society mm. about our social problems mm. that we have, mm. and it's a fun way of doing it. 100%. And it's a fun way of advocating that fitness can be fun at the same time, mm. you know. And that is our differentiating point of what our business is. That's a sick concept because I'm just thinking about it as you explain. Because as soon as you said it's like Survivor, I was like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, like, it was like that, the like, teamwork. And teams come in. Yeah, you know, and you could even have like different corporates like challenging each other, like who can escape first. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. So like we do, we do like come up with funny scenarios. Like mm. um, the last one we ran was. Um, uh, we gave this scenario. Imagine that you guys are um, holidaying through Kazakhstan, horseback riding through the <laughs> mountains, right? And you guys are drinking and you're going like bar hopping on the horse. Fucking sounds cool, right? <laughs> Fucking who would want to do that? And then you're in some mountain village um, and you've been drinking too much Kazakh beers <laughs> and you all need to go check a piss, right? Yeah. And it's pitch black at night and you're doing, you're, you're, you're doing your you know, number one and all of a sudden you got flashlights in your face and there's like cops screaming Kazakh and you're like, what's going on? You just realized you just urinated on the shrine of the deity, <laughs> right? And you've all been arrested, right? So funny, quirky scenarios like that. And yep. we tell them like, these are three stages. We mm. have three different types of things you need to do. Stage mm. one, you have to instigate a riot. Mm. Stage two, you have to dig through a tunnel. And three, you have to solve this pin code, which is um, yeah. uh, like a padlock that you got to get out of, got right? Yep. So it's like to solve the solve the combination to the padlock, you gotta do all these different exercises to mm. figure out what the number is, mm. you know? So things like that. It's fun. And at the same time, we get to talk about, you know, uh, the challenge, the social challenges that inmates go through um, and what you guys are doing, you, what you guys are doing to to donate to us or to finance. Yeah, there's a cause behind it. The cause behind yep. it, the money's going into, you mm. know, us being able to run mentoring programs and youth justice centers and to provide that ongoing support for them in the community. Mm. Dude, that's such a cool concept. Like, well, I was gonna say, Edwin, we'll have to find a time to head over as well. Like, yeah. what sort of, when's it planning to be open? So look, I've been saying October. <laughs> But <laughs> things, keep no on getting right? keep, keep things keep on getting delayed. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're planning on October, mm -hmm. soft launch in September. Okay. Yeah, Got it. that's the plan. So we're trying to get all the government down as well, like the Minister for Youth Justice to come down and, you know, have a, have a punch on the bag. And <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, like, I mean, I'm conscious of time as well. Yeah. And I feel like there's almost like a part two to this. And, um, but, you know, before we sort of wrap up, um, I, I'm, I'm so inspired by it you know, not just your story, but also just like the, the mission of Confit overall. Um, what sort of, I guess, parting words have you got for listeners? I mean, look, most of our listeners are, 
you know, they probably don't find them on the wrong side of the law, but I'm sure just as we talked about, you know, growing up Southwest meets of Asians in sort of underprivileged areas, know someone. So um, have you got a message of anything that you want to share that you haven't had a chance to share yep. about that? Yep. Our motto is train to be free. Mm -hmm. And train to be free came from, you know, when we were incarcerated, you know, our bodies were incarcerated, but whenever we used to train, our minds used to be free. You know, we came out into society and we realized you know, prison is not just a physical prison. There's a lot of metaphorical prisons, a prison mm. of the mind, prison of addiction, prison of, it can be anything that holds you back to live a free life. Mm. And what we advocate to society is train to be free. You know, it's not just about training, but do something to make you feel a bit more freer. You know, have you ever thought about, are you working that much that you're not, you don't have the time to spend with your children or mm -hmm. you don't have the time to meet up with your close friends to have those positive relationships? Or are you that busy or, you know, hesitant to do something that you've always wanted to do? Just do it. You know, you live life once. Like, like for me, what I understood was nine years, I'm never going to get the time back. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is live every day of my life as if I was free. And freedom means to be able to do what you love doing without harming others around you, mm -hmm. but to lift everyone up and to have a good positive life, you know? Mm -hmm. And everyone goes, yeah, 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 everyone talks about this. But put it this way, imagine you lost a decade of your life, mm -hmm. just gone. Imagine it was wiped out. Right, and then you're just living your life. Imagine you lost that ten years; it was gone. You didn't have any of those experiences that you had. Mm. Would you live a free life? It's that kind of mentality that we should be living with, right? Got it. So I tell everyone, you know, train to be free. That's it. And like as you were saying that, I mean, the last thing I'll say is the the book that I recently read, which everyone recommends, is like Victor Frankl's book of Man's Search oh, for yeah, Meaning. Yeah, right? Yeah. I read that in jail. I was like, did you? Yeah, yeah I read it. Yeah. In jail, yeah, and and I think there's a lot of commonalities about you know, him being in a concentration camp and having to draw purpose and meaning um, and feel like there's something he's working towards in order for him to eventually be free yep. and mentally free in That's a lot right. of ways as That's well. Right. So um, absolutely. And um, look, I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, if people want to reach out to you, whether they want to support and want to get to know you, what's the best way to get in touch yes, with you? Yes, social media, uh, Instagram handle at Confit Oz or at Confit Pathways, or you can find us online, same thing, Confit, uh, Confit Fitness mm -hmm. or uh, Confit Pathways. Amazing. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Level Asian podcast. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed the episode. And why not share it with friends and family who might enjoy it too? Also, make sure you head over to levelasianpodcast.com to join our email list and to receive the latest updates and get notified when the next episode drops. If you know a great guest we should feature, email us at contact at levelasianpodcast.com or DM us on our socials in the show notes. Catch you on the next episode.